is revolution. I'm still on quote unquote vacation, hiatus, taking a break from all things social media. That's what I that's what we're trying to say on air and sometimes it just doesn't work that way. Uh, because of technical issues that happen that you guys don't get to see. Uh, so I've been involved a little more than I would have liked to have been. But I'm also a bit of a control freak. <sighs> but still doing the clips for the show and uh, also still doing the video essay series. I'm in the process of gathering some interviews uh, for the next video essay series uh, or, or episode from that series that we do on Zero Books. It's called The Dispatch. There's an episode right now up and it's taken from good friend of show, good friend in real life, Cedric Johnson's essay on Huey Newton. It is only part one. There will be multiple parts to this uh, Huey Newton video series. So part one is up. This episode that you're going to hear tonight is uh, an episode Pascal booked. I forgot how he came across Vivek Chibber. Um, but when his name was thrown out, we were like, oh, sure. Um, and right before it got booked, and then another friend of ours that's friends with him was like, hey, why don't you guys have Vivek on? So it was kind of one of those serendipitous things where he his, his name popped up, and we were able to get him relatively easy, uh, considering the conversations we were having around having him on the show. Um I was somewhat sad I, I wasn't going to be on the show. Uh, I've seen him before. Um, I've read some essays. I, I, I won't lie and say I've read his books. I, I have read some essays. Um, the celebrity guest host was the one and only Kenzo Shibata from Class Time with Kenzo Shibata slash Meet the Left. I really like... Uh, his meet the left where he does a, a meet the press if you will of uh, left figures on the internet because what's cool about it is it's not like a clout chase so he's not constantly going after the biggest names that will respond to an email to climb up another rung in a ladder of importance he literally finds people that he finds intellectually stimulating or people that are doing good work on the ground and gives them a platform and they to speak about what they're doing he does have a lot of activists on actually uh, because he actually also comes from the activist world as a uh, in the teachers unions in Chicago and he's had me on he's of course had Marcus on a couple times from the left flank vets who's also a part of the show um, he's of course had Pascal on so we're like almost the same age we listen to the same music we happen to like know the same people in Chicago from the music game um, so we're kindred spirits, if you will, in this in this podcast world. So if there's anyone that is going to fill in and I'm going to feel comfortable that they're going to be comfortable around my not just co host, but you know, we're like family. Pascal and I are like family. So anyone that's gonna be on air with my, my brother Pascal. Kenzo Shibata is that guy. So shout out to Kenzo for filling in. Shout out to uh, to Conan for filling in. And massive, huge hugs and love to 
you know, an, a, another brother, uh, Jean Bajlan, for coming in and learning kind of on the fly a lot of the technical things uh, that we do on the show. So this show is good. You know, I, I didn't get a chance to watch it when it was happening real time because I am trying to, like, literally like, step away. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did have to, bo- uh, to host the bonus after hours s- segment because I guess the wife I went down in the small town that Jean lives in in Missouri. And if you want to hear that bonus after hours segment, there's only one way to do it. Become a patron. Patreon.com backslash Bitter Lake presents. And if you want to be a part of these conversations... When they're happening, they happen Tuesday and Thursday at 6 p.m. Pacific Time, Saturday morning, 9 a.m. Pacific Time. YouTube.com backslash This is Revolution Podcast. We're also on Twitch. Wherever you're listening to this show, there are links in the description to all our social media where you can find the show. You can also go to our website, thisisrevolutionpodcast.com, and find all the links to wherever you hear this in the audio-only version, and as well as Twitch and Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and you know we might even have a Tumblr. Is Tumblr still a thing? And on that note, here is a very spicy discussion. Vivek Chibber did not hold back. He brought his A game. And leave some comments. Tell me what you think. Some people disagreed in the comments from the original show with their take on what is postmodernism. All I know is I had to watch a lot of French philosophers to get that clip that you guys heard. And I am out. Good evening and welcome to This is Revolution Podcast. I am your host, Pascal Robert. Our official normal host, Jason Miles, is still on vacation, so I am holding down the fort while he is away. For those of you who are new to our show or new to our chat, please hit subscribe, ring the bell, or share, and also share within your networks, the program, if you will. If you have a Super Chat question you, ha- you have, please, we indulge Super Chats, but our format for tonight is going to be that we will take or answer the Super, super Chat questions in the last 10 minutes. So the subject matter for tonight's show is going to be postmodernism and its effect on the left. 
and the politics of the left. So we're going to discuss its role, where it comes from, what its what its meaning is, and how it affect, affects dialectical materialist analysis and the politics of the left and the contemporary are seen in America and globally as well. So before we do that, we have once again an intro video video for you, and we will go to the intro. The thing about the postmodernists, and I'm going to speak mostly about Jacques Derrida because I'll consider him the central villain. When we spoke in Paris and you did that improv in the apartment, you said something offhand. You said, it's very American of you, Amy, to just sort of give me a topic and ask me to speak. What did you mean by why would it be very American? What struck you about that? Parce que, parce que l'expérience, alors, ce que je veux dire par américain ici, dans mon usage du mot américain est peut-être un peu abusif, bien sûr. Euh, ce que j'appelle américain ici, c'est deux choses. L'une qui est un peu abusive, l'autre qui l'est moins. Ce qui est un peu abusif, c'est la, 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 l'attitude euh, utilitaire, manipulatrice. Voilà, euh, on a besoin de ça, do it. Euh, alors, euh, Euh, sur tel terme, allez-y, action. Alors évidemment, tous ceux qui font du cinéma font ça. Hein. Mais le cinéma, c'est américain, vous savez. Le, le cinéma est plus américain qu'autre chose. Hein. Aujourd'hui, l'expérience mondiale du cinéma est largement, comme vous le savez très bien, largement commandée, qu'on s'en réjouisse ou qu'on s'en plaigne, commandée par euh, quand même euh, la culture américaine. Bon, ça c'était la chose, euh, comment dire, abusive, l'usage abusif du mot américain, l'usage un peu vague du mot américain. L'usage moins, moins vague et, et moins abusif, c'est que souvent, dans l'université américaine, et déjà la première année où j'y étais, en 1956, j'ai remarqué ce, ces situations, à la fois sociales et académiques, où quelqu'un demande à quelqu'un d'autre, ça peut être un professeur à un étudiant, ou un étudiant à un professeur, ou un étudiant à un étudiant, et, Could you elaborate on this thing ?»« Could you elaborate ?» Voilà, je te donne un mot et « Go and work okay? ». Euh, euh, à partir de, 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 d'un mot, hein? « Elaborate ». Et aujourd'hui encore, des étudiants américains, « During my office hours », they just come and say, uh, « Could you ?» Could you tell me more about this or that? Could you elaborate? On it? Et ça, euh, ça se ferait pas en France, par exemple. Ça, c'est exclu encore. Que quelqu'un dise à quelqu'un. Alors, euh, pouvez-vous euh, euh, elaborate? Je sais pas comment dire ça en français. C'est, c'est, je dis pas que ça n'arrive jamais, mais c'est beaucoup moins fréquent et beaucoup moins probable. Ça arrive quelquefois, et ça aussi, c'est américain. C'est, c'est américain en premier sens, abusif dont je parlais. Ça arrive dans les dans les interviews euh, radio télévisées où des journalistes pressés et utilitaires, euh, des journalistes manipulateurs, pensent que on peut demander à, à, à quelqu'un parce qu'il est philosophe, parce qu'il est professeur de philosophie, de tout d'un coup parler de euh, l'être, hein <rire> comme si euh, on appuyait sur un bouton et puis qu'on avait euh, a ready-made discourse on being or, or, or love. Non, I have nothing ready-made. Okay? Donc euh, Donc il y a un sens abusif du mot américain qui concerne toutes les, toutes les attitudes cinématographico-journalistico-manipulatrices. Et puis il y a un sens plus, plus strictement américain qui fait référence à cet usage qu'on a dans l'université de demander à quelqu'un to elaborate. With the raging culture war and debates around critical race theory, we will discuss how postmodern theory became a dominant force in academia that derailed materialist analysis of social and political phenomena. In this episode, we will investigate the origins of postmodern thought and its consequences for today's politics. This is Revolution. Je suis dans ma, dans ma démarche beaucoup moins avancé, je vais beaucoup moins loin que Monsieur Chomsky, c'est-à-dire que J'avoue n'être pas capable de définir, il n'y a plus forte raison de proposer un modèle de fonctionnement social idéal pour notre société scientifique ou technologique. En revanche, une des tâches qui me paraît urgente 
immédiate, avant même toute autre chose, c'est celle-ci. On a l'habitude, du moins dans notre société européenne, de considérer que le pouvoir, il est localisé entre les mains du gouvernement et il s'exerce par un certain nombre d'institutions bien particulières qui sont l'administration, en France on appelle ça préfectorale, enfin je ne sais pas comment vous dire ailleurs, l'administration, la police, l'armée. On sait que toutes ces, ces institutions-là sont faites pour transmettre les ordres, les faire appliquer et punir euh, les gens qui n'obéissent pas. Mais je crois que le pouvoir politique, il s'exerce encore, il s'exerce en outre, de plus, par l'intermédiaire d'un certain nombre, nombre d'institutions qui ont l'air comme ça de n'avoir rien de commun avec le pouvoir politique, qui ont l'air d'en être indépendantes et qui ne le sont pas. On sait bien que l'université, d'une façon générale, tout le système scolaire, qui en apparence est fait simplement pour distribuer le savoir, on sait que cet appareil scolaire est fait pour maintenir au pouvoir une certaine classe sociale et exclure des instruments du, du pouvoir euh, toute une autre classe sociale. Well, all right, another great intro. Well, well, well we're going to introduce our co-host. Our co-host, Kenzo Shibata, is a Chicago high school English history teacher, host of Meet the Left on Twitch and the Kenzo Shibata podcast, current member of the Chicago Teachers Union, executive board, and co-founder of the Caucus of Rank and File Educators. He's written for, the, for In These Times, The Nation, Jacobin, Salon, Huffington Post. New Politics, and is former editor-in-chief of the Chicago, Chicago Union Teacher, and he has a master's degree in public policy from Northwestern University. Let us welcome again Kenzo Shibata to the Thank show. Thank you so much, Pascal. Appreciate you coming you. back on. Thank you, Xavier. And we will introduce our guest for the moment, Dr. and Professor Vivek Cheber. He's an American academic, social theorist, editor, and professor of sociology at New York University, who has published widely on development and social theory and politics. Dr. Cheber is the author of two books, Postcolonial Theory and the Specter of Capital, Verso 2013, and Locked in Place, State, Build, State Building and Late Industrialization in India, Princeton 2003. Uh, also, uh, Vivek Cheber has launched Catalyst, a journal of theory and strategy, and is also the editor of that publication. Welcome, Vivek Cheber, well-known figure on the left. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me, you guys. Looking forward to general. Great so, meeting you. As gen as you, to put this in proper context, as we like to do for our audience in our chat, uh, Professor uh, Cheber, can you explain to us What is, if you can give us a definition, because it will be the first time, what is postmodernism? Where does it come from? What are the basic tenets of this philosophical tendency, if you will? Well, maybe I should do like Derrida in your intro and take six minutes and say absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like the heat. I like the heat. Um, It, th there's not a precise definition of postmodernism or its cognates like um, post-structuralism or even post-colonialism. These are, these are more um, conventional terms which people use in a variety of different ways. So it, it, whenever, and it, is a, it was one of the favorite uh, games of postmodernist or post-structuralist theorists is that whenever you try to define what their philosophy or their approach is, they immediately say, well, that's not what it is or you're being too narrow or uh, you're trying to cage us and pin us down and things like that. Because one of the, uh, the, the favorite techniques of the philosophy is to confuse confusion with profundity, being vague with being profound, uh, not like the Derrida in your clip going on and on and on and on about nothing as if there's some deep truths hidden in that. So it's kind of a trap to try to define it, but you know, any reasonable, intelligent discussion of any philosophy has to start with definitions. So we'll have to take our blows and try to make some sense of what this beast is before we engage it, before we uh, critique it. So very broadly speaking, postmodernism is a term that's used or poststructuralism, which, and they're often used interchangeably, 
are terms used to define a philosophical movement or a theoretical movement that starts up uh, late 60s, identified mainly with French philosophy, but it has its parallels in Germany as well. It has some parallels in American pragmatism as well. The tenets of which are actually quite well known to anybody familiar with the history of philosophy because it revives and resuscitates uh, some very old nostrums in philosophical history. And for people who watch this uh, show who might be familiar with the history of Marxism, for example, the easiest way to understand postmodernism is that it's the latest incarnation of what you would call idealism. And what mm. we mean by idealism is that primarily it's an epistemological position. It's a position that says that true knowledge of the world is A, um, unlikely to be had, and B, mm. the reason it's unlikely to be had is that access to the world is never given to us directly. They, our access to the world is mediated through ideas, through discourse, through conventions, through culture. And because culture, ideology, um, uh, discourse intervenes between us and the world, it means that it shapes our per perception of the world. So we're all we are ever actually seeing is the discourse and the ideology. In the case of post-structuralism, it was language that does the work. It comes from this philosopher, a linguist named Saussure. Uh, in the philosophy, it came from Derrida. In Derrida, it's discourse, which you can think of as language, but he means it more widely as ideas generally. In Foucault, it becomes the episteme, which is the reigning epistemological conventions of the time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are notions that we're familiar, familiar with since the time of the Enlightenment and even prior to that, even Plato in his convention of the caves and his doctrine of the caves. So the basic idea of postmodernism, post-structuralism, is that our understanding of the world is profoundly and indeed overwhelmingly, definitively shaped by discourse. That's the idea. Now that overturns the traditional, not just Marxist, but the traditional socialist commitment to what's called materialism. Mm. Now materialism has a couple of different propositions that are central to it as well. The first is that our ideas about the world are in fact constrained by the structure of the world. They're not constrained by discourse, the world itself has an impact on our understanding of it. What that means is we are in fact engaging the world. We're not just engaging ideas. Discourse might even mediate our access to the world, but it doesn't shape our knowledge of the world. The world itself has an effect on our knowledge of what's true and untrue, right and wrong. Secondly, what materialists say is that on the basis of this understanding of the world, we can seek to change it. Now, here's what it comes down to for socialists for Marxists. If you think that all knowledge claims about the world are just claims, they have no way of being tested or being as being true or false, that they're simply just shots in the dark, that they're simply just conventions, you have absolutely no business going about trying to tell people to join in a struggle to change the world. Mm. Because it's hard and it's risky. And you're asking them to take make real sacrifices on the basis of what? Of having no knowledge whatsoever. So Marxists responded to this, the growth of post-structuralism, post-modernism, with a very critical eye saying, if this is true, we've got to give up the game. We can't be engaged in real serious politics if discourse shapes our ideas of the world instead of our ideas of the world being shaped by the world itself. Now, as it happens, when post-structuralism comes around, Marxists are a dying breed. So it quickly displaces Marxism as the radical philosophy that academics come to. And academics, for a variety of reasons we can get into later, at the time, now we're talking about the 70s and 80s, flock to postmodernism because it provides a function for them, which they desperately need at the time, which Marxism does not. And by the 90s, it's really overtaken what used to be the reigning radical approach, which is Marxist theory, Marxism is displaced by it, and the effects of that are being felt today as well. Kenzo, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, I mean, what is really coming up for me here is uh, what I'm seeing like in the movement politics 
is, uh, you know, we had this huge national project with Bernie Sanders, and I'm not trying to canonize him, but it was a time when a lot of um, different aspects of the left came together under one big project. And when that collapsed, it seemed like, you know, I'm particularly looking in the the DSA, um, a lot of folks started looking inward and the um, kind of a more prevailing uh, politics is trying to critiquing our own institutions, but not finding a way to, to make them grow. Uh, so like we're trying, you know, I, I'm seeing a lot of resolutions and bylaws being passed in different chapters where it's about like having X amount of people of color um, on a certain board or, you know, certain things to uh, make it to, 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 to change the way that comrades interact in meetings by policy and not just by like camaraderie. Um, I'm just wondering if you're seeing, you know, that being an impact of postmodernism and specifically like how that, you know, uh, kind of wormed its way into movement politics. Yeah, um, I would not say that's a consequence of postmodernism. Okay. That's a consequence of particular social conditions that the left is now inhabiting and particular institutional spaces that it's been inhabiting for 30, 35 years now. Uh, and the class character of the left, the class environment that it inhabits. I'll come to that in one second, uh, mm -hmm. Kenzo. The postmodernism or poststructuralism is important because it's given a vocabulary to this. And it's given a kind of patina of academic and theoretical respectability to the inwardness, to the inward orientation, the self-absorption, the in many times the narcissism that you see on the left. So we have to now separate these two things. First, we have to ask the question, well, what are the social conditions? What is the class environment that's behind these phenomena that you just described very accurately, I think, this obsession with process? the constant inward orientation, the way the meetings turn into therapy sessions for everybody, the way politics is judged by how it makes me feel, not by what it accomplishes, these sorts of things. Well, I think there the answer is actually quite clear. Um, the current left, <laughs> I've been on many shows beating this drum now, so I guess it's getting kind of repetitive. The current left is unusual, it's unique in that it's the first left in the global history that has no connection to the working class. It's entirely an artifact of professionals, academics, uh, some uh, school teachers who increasingly are proletarianized, we shouldn't call them um, professionals, mm -hmm. but um, software engineers, uh, young people who are college educated and are looking for jobs with a college degree. These sorts of people were on the left in the 30s, 40s, 50s too, but they didn't define it. They were disciplined by the trade union movement, by the working class, both black working class and white working class. And they had to enter the political culture in which working class people were engaged in politics to get things done. Mm. And if you wanted to go on and on and on and on about your feelings and how, how your, uh, what your psychological condition is today, you're told, go home, get your shit together. And when you're ready to come back and do your politics, we'll, we'll have you back. But we'd really like to talk about how to organize the strike how to organize this march, how to make our demands uh, understood, how to bring more people into the movement and how to make it more powerful. That was the culture. So if you were an academic and you came to the left, you were expected to essentially acclimate to the political culture of a working class movement. Mm. What happens by the 1980s in the United States is that trade unions are largely destroyed or they're at least in retreat and on their way to being destroyed. The civil rights movement is dead, and yet now you have a black political kind of professional class that's becoming the spokes uh, agent for black demands, and is turning those demands, which were very much working class demands, into demands for professional advancement, for more capital, for more loans for community development, the kind of things Adolf Reed has talked about and written about. The entire left discourse is overtaken by the middle class, and so what happens is now this is a class for whom economic demands, class demands, don't really matter that much because it's doing okay for itself economically. So two things happen. The demands of the left increasingly turn into demands around discrimination, microaggressions, cultural expressions, language, culture, these sorts of things. Everything but 
the economic demands, which not just somehow on the left, we think today, this is, this is what white people do. People of color for the, all the 20th century, their primary demands were political representation and economic rights. These all they came together. That's gone by the 80s, whether you're black or whether you're white. So the first thing that happens is you, the demands turn into discrimination demands, anti-discrimination demands, cultural demands, these sorts of things. The second thing that happens is if you're middle class and you're coming to these sorts of things, these movements, these organizations, for many middle class people, this is something you do in your off time. After you come back from work, you do it as a hobby. You do it uh, as a kind of moonlighting thing, which means eh, you're happy to do it, but you don't have to do it. So people come and go. And these groups shrink. They become smaller and smaller and smaller. And the only space in which they are actually able to survive is universities and institutions around universities. So now what happens inside these spaces? The, the discussions become heavily accented with academic jargon. The concerns become the concerns of academics. And the culture becomes the culture of academics. Who comes to academics? Mostly social misfits. Pe people who just bury their heads in books all the time. Most of them are unhappy people. And they come to the left as a solution to their middle class unhappiness. Hmm. And that's the inward turn. That's when you've come to the left because you're unhappy in your middle class life. Unhappy in your middle class life. And you want to know, why am I unhappy? And that's why the meeting is not judged by its ability to change the world. It's judged by its ability to make yourself inhabit a better space mentally and psychologically. That's the material social basis for everything you've described. It's not just after Bernie's movement died down that this happens. I saw this happening in the 90s. And it's been this way since. I came from India. It was shocking to see what goes on in left-wing meetings. You never discuss politics. <laughs> what you discuss is, why did this dude speak for five minutes? I only spoke for three minutes. Why are there five white people in the room and only one black person? Why are there not enough women? What, what, why, what is the LGBT? It was my friend in Madison used to call it, a, it's a, a DNA count. You come in and you, you judge the meeting by who's in the meeting. That this is not irrelevant, you, should, you know, these things matter, but this is all that matters. Mm -hmm. That's because of the class character of this thing. So then, would you, uh, yeah, go ahead. Would you argue that what ends up becoming the left project is equality of opportunity distribution and recognition in a pie that becomes shrinking for the elites and just about among the elites that becomes almost disappearing for everyone else. That's so exactly right. See, look, what was the traditional left, the core of left politics? It was economic redistribution. And if you're really ambitious, property relations, changing property relations, right? From capitalist to some sort of socialist, ones, right? It was an attack on the market. The essence of the left was the market cannot rule our lives. What happens by the 90s is it's for more advancement within the market. Mm. You don't question the market. Anti-discrimination politics basically says, hey, I'm as qualified as you are to get this job, but I don't, I don't get it because I'm a woman or because I'm black, and that's unfair. What socialists said is, why do you have to be dependent on the market in the first place? Why do you have to be dependent on the labor market in the first place? We want everybody to have guaranteed uh, guaranteed the necessities of life, to housing, to medical care, to a job, et cetera, et cetera. What anti-discrimination politics, Pascal, of the kind you've described says, I'm not gonna question the fact that we all have to fight against each other in the labor market. What I wanna know is why am I disadvantaged in the labor market because of my color? Now, that's a legitimate demand, but it's a demand of an upwardly mobile black class, an upwardly mobile section of the black population, not of the black working class. The black working class discrimination matters. It's one of the things that they care about, but they also care about, hey, there's no jobs in Detroit. There are no jobs. There's no jobs in Cleveland. We need to make that the issue. So this is how very quickly it changes. It's about getting a slice, a bigger slice of the pie, not about the way the pie itself is baked. Can you explain to us how the rise of postmodernism or poststructuralism maps into the sharp neoliberal turn of the 80s, which, of course, we know starts in the 70s, but the sharp turn takes in the 80s. In other words, is the popularity of postmodernism slash poststructuralism a consequence of the neoliberal turn, 
or does it help foster the neoliberal turn? Or perhaps there are nefarious forces in the foundation world that give sukkar to this type of intellectual development to help it further displace Marxism or materialism in academia. Not to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but if you want to, I wouldn't be mad. Uh, well, claims about the foundation world aren't conspiratorial. Those are institutions, they do fund, they do make decisions, and that's not a conspiracy theory. So I, I, I wouldn't demean what you're saying by calling it a conspiracy theory. I'll come back to the foundations in a second, Pascal. Let me address the first thing, the first part of what you said, because it's very important. Um, post structuralist theory and its ascendance in the academy it, at its essence is a consequence of neoliberalism, not its cause. But once it takes hold, it has an enormous impact on the reconstitution of the left and thereby strengthens neoliberalism as well, <laughs> which you might call it's a dialectical relationship. So let, let me um, get explain what I mean by that. It's a consequence of uh, neoliberalism in two particular ways. First of all, neoliberalism is made possible in large measure because the institutions that were built up over the last 50 years of the labor movement are dismantled or destroyed. You know, to an extent that we had never seen in the modern era, not even in the era of fascism. There was, there's never been a time when the left was flat on its back the way it was in the United States and England in the 1990s, and then in on the continental Europe in the early 2000s. It's the weakest it's ever been. That weakness to the intelligentsia generates an, a culture, a psychology of defeat, of cynicism, of the sense that you cannot change the world, it's just too much. That's why somebody like Foucault becomes so popular in the intelligentsia because Foucault says the essence of Foucault's theory of power is that you can't dismantle power. Power simply changes its form when you go from one society to the other, when you go from capitalism into socialism. So you can't struggle against it. All these politics that were aimed at macro structural transformation of society, socialism coming out of the enlightenment, revolutionary politics, all they did, Foucault says, is replace one kind of despotism with another. Liberation will come not from changing society, but by fighting in its interstices. That's the term used. In corners, nooks and crannies here and there. Now you tell a middle-class person for whom the world is basically okay, but it's these little odds and ends that needs to be fixed. You tell them, hey, the odds and ends are where the battle is. You're gonna have a happy camper. They're gonna be very happy with this. And they embrace the intelligentsia because it's in the professional class and the middle class, it embraces this philosophy. It already loves the fact that the philosophy is telling them you will never understand the world. That was the idealism that I talked about. So now if I can't understand it, how am I gonna change it? Why even try to change it? Secondly, structural, profound structural changes are useless because they'll just bring about a new form of power. So we're gonna fight in the interstices. Well, here's a little interstices for you, the classroom. I'm gonna to fight to liberate the classroom. I'm gonna to fight to liberate this meeting that I'm gonna have at eight o'clock today. I'm gonna to fight to liberate this TV show because I don't like the way in which characters are being depicted. So the cynicism turns into a full liberation. You're liberating these little nooks and crannies here and there. That's a consequence of the defeat of neoliberalism. The other part of neoliberalism that feeds this post-structuralist turn is the individualism that neoliberalism fosters. Because what once you can't organize a class, once you can't change society, once you can't join a movement to do ambitious things, change starts from within. It's about you changing yourself, right? All this sort of stuff. So that's all a consequence of a defeat and post-structuralism gives a vocabulary for all this. Now, of course, that comes the second part. Once it becomes the culture of the left, it's no longer a left. So the hmm. one historical force that's been anti-capitalist for the last 150 years, it's reduced to these professionals in urban spaces who now say, organize, schmorganize. What am I going to do with all that? What I'm going to do is talk about microaggressions. What I'm going to do is talk about the culture wars, this, that, and the other. So now on the left today, on the left today, every time you raise economic demands, some clown in the room is going to say something like, 
well, that's economic reductionism. That's they've got all these, you know, buzzwords. That's class Max reductionism. reductionism. Yep. Uh, that is ignoring my situation. And mm -hmm. the reason that's important is that, well, it's me. And what's more important than me? These ridiculous terms came up in the 80s. What you're saying doesn't speak to my condition. That's an 80s term. The notion that something is wrong because it's offensive. Nobody, nobody in the history of the left ever used the term offensive. Offensive is a subjective individual mm -hmm. term. We said this is racist. We said this is imperialist. We said this is sexist, but we never said this is off offensive. comes from a culture that says, if I feel that something is wrong, it's wrong because I feel it. All this stuff right now inside the left, it, the theoretical expression, the theoretical vocabulary for the self-absorption and the narcissism and the inward looking orientation, that vocabulary came from post-structuralism. I want to, and I'm, I'm not that I disagree with you, but I want to add an inflection point, maybe push back a little bit. In terms of the left abandoning the working class, someone brought up an interesting question in the chat. When Nixon comes to power in the early 70s and he courts the working class, as the reactionaries have done over the 50-year counter-revolution, which is a theme we have on this show that basically argues that the politics that happens in the United States in the West post-68 basically is a counter-revolution against the new the New Deal Civil Rights Coalition of the prior prior periods. How do we account for the fact that the reactionaries actually kind of subsume the working class to an extent, i.e. the Reagan Democrats, i.e. the Nixon hard hats, and that their reactionary uh, politics, I, I don't want to say nature, their reactionary development or the phenomenon of their reactionary worldview makes them somewhat uh, unable to be appealed to by left politics. How would you respond to that? That that those 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 phenomenon. Uh, when when you right. say their reactionary politics, you mean the working class reactionary politics? The, rea the, the working class that was particularly appealed that appeal that was appealed to by the reactionary right, i.e. Nixon, i.e. Reagan in the early seventies. I mean, some would say even maybe Trump. It, um, I don't think it's a surprise at all, uh, Pascal. Uh, the working class wasn't made by God in the form of an angel. It's ordinary human beings who are every day being socialized and being shaped by all sorts of forces culturally. Um, fascism had a very important place for the working class as well. Today in the global South, the far right movements that are developing draw the working class to, to themselves as well. This has been true from the Russian revolution onwards. We shouldn't be surprised by that. And that's why for the left, it's so important to be immersed within the working class so that they have a presence that can fight culturally, politically, organizationally to bring the working class to its side. They don't come automatically. That's a struggle. The reason they don't come automatically and they are sometimes drawn to these reactionary forces, like you're saying, is that the reactionary forces appeal to very real anxieties and very real economic needs that the working class has. So Nixon isn't just saying to them, join up with me and we'll go clobber the world or we're going to beat back the civil rights movement or we're going to capture the television stations. He's saying, join up with me and I'm going to give you a better life. Anytime the message of the right is made to the working class without the promise of a better life, it tends to fail. And the reason they can promise that better, better life is that they do control the main institutions of society. Now, the promise is often hollow. In neoliberalism, for 50 years, it's failed. But it's always a promise to say, I'm going to be able to fix this for you. The reason the left all over Europe and the United States, social democratic parties, left parties, ha are hemorrhaging working class voters is they don't even try to say that anymore. What they, what they have now is overwhelmingly a cultural message. And lots of finger wagging, lots of lecturing and haranguing to workers, the American left wants the working class to fill out a form to see whether it's worthy of them or not. In that situation, they're, they're gonna go to the right. There's just no way around. So, I, I mean, I, I very much take your point. I just think it's not a surprise that the right appeals to the working class because they have votes and they've got to try to get those votes. The right tries to get, uh, bring them to their side with a package, with an ideology, but that always includes material benefits. And that's where they are uh, today being more successful than the left. 
Well, Kenzo, you want to add any questions? Yeah, I uh, so I worked as a union organizer for for a few years. I took a leave of absence from teaching to do that. And one of the locals I worked with, uh, they were a grad student local. This is not going to surprise you what I'm about to say. Um, they got microaggressions written into their contract. So if an administrator um, acts a microaggression against a grad student, they can grieve it. Now, as a cynical union guy, I'm like, well, a microaggression could be anything. I don't. I mean, that's never really been defined to me. This might just be a way of fighting the bosses. It's whatever but, I say it is. Absolutely. Um, which is usually what the the leverage of the bosses have. I do though see that having this mentality within their union, though, that microaggressions are a thing that can eventually implode upon itself. And so, what I'm thinking. You know, I guess what my question is, like, as an organizer, I'm thinking, like, is it possible to, like, have that uh, inward facing kind of politics and, you know, material, uh, real material analysis? Can that exist in a dialectic? Because when I do work with, like, young teachers, also, I'm a teacher, I'm back in the classroom, they're really into this stuff. And that stuff does get them excited to be involved in the union when you hear about the kind of identity based politics. But I do fear that it's something that's going to implode upon itself, um, even it's though already, it does look, activate no, people. I mean, look, it's been 20 years of this stuff. Why, why is the left, why, why does it have any traction whatsoever at this moment? It's because of Bernie Sanders. Hmm. It's because Sanders is the first politician in 50 years to come into politics and say to the population, A, you have rights. B, you're all suffering, and that's common across so many of your identities, so many of your ethnicities and genders, et cetera. And C, um, it's possible to unite around these things. And this is a message that from 1905 to about 1975, any social democrat or any politician on the left worth his salt took as being his calling card. Sanders is the first politician in 40 years to even bring it up. You take Sanders out of the equation, what do you have? You have, over the past 20 years, a left that is basically just a social club. It's people talking amongst themselves of the professional classes. It is not the union movement. That, that left has very little connection with the union movement. It is not any kind of liberation movement. Liberation movements were tiny little, movement is a wrong word. They were little affinity groups by the early 2000s. You saw something building with the anti-globalization movement, but it died by, because of 9-11. And even after the uh, Occupy Wall Street, the left was still very, it was basically a media event, not so much any kind of real organizing. Organizing died under the weight of this culture that you're, Kenzo, that you're describing. If a, if a well-adjusted working class person, black, white, or brown, walks into a meeting where the whole meeting is about these microaggressions, this kind, they never come back. I've seen it happen. They never come back. They're like half the time, they can't even understand what's being said because the language is so awkward. It's so jargon. So uh, not only is it going to implode, Ken, it's 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 been imploded. I've saw I've been in it. I saw it. I witnessed it, and I walked away after a point. It's been that way for over 25 years. Another question I want to add to, to a pivot on your point, uh, Vivek, is that doesn't the kind of uh, subsuming of the new left into academia start really, or the left into academia, start in the 60s with the yeah. student movement? Doesn't it also start with, isn't the thing that makes the working class turned off by the left, frankly, is that the abandonment of the working class didn't even start during the 50-year counter-revolution, but really goes back to the new left of the 60s, where it becomes a quote-unquote college student-oriented movement as opposed to a working class movement. Yeah, and uh, Pascal, this goes back to your point about Nixon. One of the things Nixon is drawing on in his campaigns is pointing to these hippies and these countercultures and saying to American workers, they hate you, they don't appreciate you, there again, it, it was a kind of incipient version of MAGA that, that Trump was uh, working on. And it was drawing on, on this, this phenomenon of the left becoming associated with educated elites. Now, I want to just temper that a little bit, what you've said. What happens in the 60s, I think, is that 
SDS is the emblem of the student movement. And uh, it has, you know, hundreds, tens of thousands of members, over 100,000 members uh, by the mid 60s. Um, the thing about SDS is, though, there's a big chunk of it that recognizes that, look, if we're just going to stay on these campuses, we're going to die out very quickly. And a, a stream within it, several streams, some of them Maoists, some of them Trotskyists, some of them Black liberation people, they go to join the working class. So they are they are recognizing that we can't just inhabit these upward these spaces for upward mobility. Problem is they go out into the working class, 68 to 72, 73, right at the time when manufacturing is starting to die off. So you get the Maoists going to Detroit and joining the auto unions just in time to all get laid off. You get some of the Trotskyists, the IS going into uh, uh, the uh, uh, TDU, the, the, the Teamsters. They manage to survive. There's all these other sectors where they go and they get de they get deindustrialized. That severs a link that could have been forged between this new left that's coming up and the working class. Once that link is severed, now we're talking about the mid 70s. Once that link is severed, now Pascal, the, the process you're talking about really takes hold. And that is absolutely where the left dies. Once if you wanted to, dis I mean, McCarthy had it all wrong. You didn't have, you didn't need all this red scare and all this. If you wanted to kill the left, just give it jobs in the university. Um, they'll kill themselves within ten years. Within ten years, they'll be gone. NGOs that's too. <laughs> <laughs> that's really that. That's what happened. Mm. What do you think about the work of people like uh, Edward Said's Orientalism as part of the postmodern world, replacing materialist critiques of imperialism with critiques that are discourse? They can coexist within global capitalism. Um, well, two issues ago in Catalyst, I, I had an article on Said uh, called Orientalism and Its Afterlives. Whoever asked this question, I um, re recommend that you go there. In there, I presented a criticism of Said as um, you know an important figure intellectually, but whose uh, uh, Orientalism as a work, I, I think, did great damage uh, because it was funded in its essence, the argument was not only flawed, but self-defeating, contradictory. So I think as an analytical work, uh, it's very weak. In terms of damage, absolutely. Uh, it did untold damage. Now, Said can't be faulted entirely for that because you know he, he publishes a book, what people do with it, <laughs> that's, that's their business, not his. But he did fuel and give license to the way in which his book was used and the fundamental way in which his book was used primarily. It wasn't just the fact that it fueled post-structuralism. Lots of books did that. Said was the, the figure who made it respectable for uh, on the left to bash Marx as a white imperialist and Marxism Ooh. as a Eurocentric theory. Um, I entered grad school right at the time that this was starting and I, you know, I was still only a few, few years out of India. I was absolutely blown away that these white grad students would come into class and say Marx is just a white dude who is an imperialist. And I'm coming from the global south where literally hundreds of millions of people look to Marx as being an answer to uh, India's and the global south's economic predicament. And here's these, <laughs> these uh, highly credentialed PhDs uh, announcing that no, Marx actually was just a white dude. Uh, that's Foucault didn't do that. Derrida didn't do that. Said did that, and it's still done. Wow! So the idea of centering Marxism as a kind of Eurocentric, otherized notion of analysis, divorce. This is very common, particularly in Afrocentric thought, in oh, some yeah. Black nationalist thought. Yeah. Very common to try to uh, delegitimize class or dialectical materialist analysis of black political phenomenon as being quote unquote Eurocentric or quote unquote, you know, oh, you know, you're just, you know, you're just one of those got black guys who's being brainwashed by those white socialists, et cetera, et cetera, so on and so forth. What's particularly fascinating to me personally is that the utility of Marxist or class analysis for me as a, 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 a Haitian American stems not so much so much from me being romanticized about Marx, is that I've seen how class amongst Black people shapes the actual material reality of life in a country like Haiti. And understanding that class analysis and dialectical materialism cannot be escaped 
from analyzing the reality of that country. So every time I hear black folks say that Marxism is a white thing, I was like, please show me one place in the world where black people are not betrayed by a comprador elite or, 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 or a colonial bourgeoisie or a, a black political class. I mean, the, think the, about the, this, Pascal. We are now 40 years out of the African independence, 50 years in many cases. And this is where the discussion is. The left is a group of children. You're having to tell people on the left, hey man, you really think that in sub-Saharan Africa, there is not a black ruling class? Look at, the, look at South Africa right now. Look what, Jake, look what Jacob Zuma is doing. Look at the way he's criminalized politics. You think this has nothing to do with material interests? Look at India, a post-colonial country. Look at Latin America and their landed elites and the dictatorships that they fostered. You think this is the white man? The American left right now is the equivalent of a child when you have these discussions. So this is just to not only to affirm what you're saying, but to say it's you don't know what to do. You don't know how, whether to shake your head or what, because these are the easiest questions in the world. And we're still stuck on these questions. We can't even get to the hard questions about devising strategy, about an economic program, about how to deal with global debt, about how to deal with, with uh, climate change. We're still stuck on if a white guy says something, could it be true? I mean, that's the left. Kenzo, you have any follow up questions? I mean, one of the things that's really coming up for me is when people say, like, let's not listen to Mar let's not read Marx. And then they come up with a bunch of other people to read that say approximately what Marx says. And this also comes up in meetings where every year, uh, should we use Robert's rules comes up. And then you have a bunch of alternatives that are essentially Robert's rules. And <laughs> so like right. this, you know, hypercritical being hypercritical of like your own movement, all it does is slow it down is what I see. And it seems to be very um, intentional. And one of the things I'm seeing as a teacher right now is that we are in a crisis moment. I like how you said that we are being proletarianized right now. And we are in this crisis moment where we have to decide, are we part of this professional managerial class that doesn't want us anymore, that wants us going into classrooms without proper uh, ventilation um, by the stroke of their pen, or are we going to, you know, organize amongst the working class? And um, I guess I guess it's kind of a broad question. Do you see us, uh, you know, a, a labor movement possible that it would be possible to cut through all this, you know, discourse that people yes. are inundated uh, with? I think. And I how think do we the, get there? The well, that's that's a sixty-four thousand dollar <laughs> question. My, Look, th this stuff cannot be sustained if you're in a milieu where people's lives are at stake, where they're trying to get health care, where they're trying to get jobs. They enter into a room and this kind of bullshit is what passes for discourse. Uh, they will either run out of the room screaming or they will kick you out. Mm. This stuff will, if the left becomes once again connected to the lives of working people, the way Sanders says, you know, it, it needs to be. Um, you will see a lot of this stuff fall by the wayside. We are, I think, in a moment today that is much better than anything even five years ago because we're at least posing the question. Kenzo, the way you brought up these, this, these questions weren't even raised five or six years ago. You couldn't even mm. bring them up because working class is a construct. It's just white people. This is just class ideology. It's uh, uh, Eurocentric. It's uh, unions are phallocentric, heteronormative institutions, all this kind of stuff. So, wow. The fact that we're, we're talking about it's a positive step, but it's gonna take a long time. And the reason for that is the left right now doesn't even have a good understanding of what the social geography of the working class is. Mm -hmm. Where do we go to organize? We don't have a template. Which city should we target? You know, if you look at the communists in the 1930s, they said, we're gonna go into Detroit, into Chicago. We're gonna go into Cleveland. We're gonna open up five, we're gonna rent five buildings. We're gonna have, 10 cells that are working there and you have to report back on how that's being done. That's a level of specificity that inside the DSA or inside, if the DSA isn't the organization, some other one, that's where you have to get to. Where we are right now is at the position of rediscovering the importance of politics as opposed to theater and generating a vocabulary and a framework for engaging in politics. That's where we are. If we get to the point where a critical mass of the left comes together, a few thousand people and says, enough of this bullshit, let's have a meeting and decide where we're gonna organize workers. 
instead of simply reclassifying ourselves as workers, which is what mm -hmm. academics love to do. Mm -hmm. We're going to go, where are we going to organize the workers? How are we going to do it? That's when this solution that you're pointing to with, with all the jargon and the discourse falls away. That's when it'll happen. As long as the left is primarily located within the working class, it will never happen. Never. Okay, we have some super chats we'd like to go to. I think I, I know the answer to this question. This is from Jim Vernon. I'd love to hear Vivek's thoughts about the theorization of blackness or other forms of racial alterity in the postmodern humanities. <laughs> well, I think it's mostly bullshit. Um, there's not much to theorize in blackness, first of all. <laughs> what you can theorize is the conditions behind the oppression of black people or other ethnicities or races in this. But blackness itself, somebody has to show me what the theoretical profundities of blackness are. What is it that's hard to understand about it? First of all, uh, how do you have a universal definition for an identity that's yeah. not necessarily universally applied for yeah. people who may or may not refer to themselves as black? Yeah, this it just a... comes down to some very obvious truisms. So, uh, But what you get is, because these departments need to justify themselves, you get an enormous amount of hot air and new, uh, new uh, neologisms and a vocabulary that every five years you replace the same idea with a new word. This kind of stuff happens. So I, I, I'm sorry if this answer is a bit vague, but um, if, you, if, if, if the question is posed more specifically, I'll be able to answer it. But the te basic template of my answer is it's, it's mostly just hot air, this theorizing of alterity and blackness. Second question. Isn't the new left the product of the war on labor that starts with Taft Hartley in 47 is followed and is followed by McCarthy purge of the 50s and the FDI, FBI intervention? In important ways, yes. And I'll tell you why. The new left comes about because the old left is destroyed. And that was a huge historical tragedy. Um, I think something like the new left would have happened anyway, because the new left is a product of deep changes within American society, and in particular, the explosion of universities, and then the, dege the degeneration, the, I should say the further degeneration of the Soviet Union and the efforts on the left to extricate themselves from the kind of orthodox official communism that the Communist Party had. I think that would have happened anyway. But what McCarthyism did that was so important, and I think in this show, it should be noted that it was so important, it destroyed the organic connections that socialists and communists had with the working class in America. And in particular, it just destroyed an enormous cadre of black communists who had been trained by the CIO, by the Communist Party, who were dedicated to black working class politics. They were driven out of politics. And it was then the black new left the black power movement, the civil rights movement that starts building it up again. And that part of it implodes and part of it is thrown into jail. The cops kill them off or they're deindustrialized. But that incipient rebuilding of the black left was absolutely devastated uh, by the late 1970s and 80s. And that was part of the larger de devastation of the old left. So all you have now is this new left and its infirmities and its weaknesses. And we never, we're never been, we've never never been able to come out of it. You've got another super chat here. Why does the American left ignore the socialism that happened or is happening in the global South so badly or so hard? And I have a follow-up for this one. Uh, that's a loaded question. Um, it all depends on which countries you think you're talking about. Uh, my experience with the American left is because they're mostly students and professionals, they are more interested in what's happening in other countries than what's happening in their own backyard. In the 80s and 90s, you could get 200 people in a meeting about um, El Salvador or Indonesia. And if there's a strike in Decatur, Illinois, that you tried to get people to come out in solidarity for, you'd get like three people. So uh, th this fascination with the exotic, with other countries, is actually quite deep on the American left. So I. We might be talking about different things, the questioner and myself, but I, it's not my impression that the U.S. left ignores the rest of the world. It's mostly its own country that it ignores. 
So I just got a question actually from a friend of mine, my friend Honda, um, which is a good follow up to this one. He wants you to talk about the current discourse around settler colonialism and making the U.S. working class culpable for the extractive treatment of the global south. No, well, I think it's fundamentally mistaken. I mean, there, there is this academic movement to make settler colonialism the Ur concept, the foundational concept. So that capitalism is derivative of settler colonialism. And unless you, if you talk about capitalism, you, you're kind of effacing the centrality of the settler colonial history. And I just think that's wrong. I, I, I think settler colonialism itself is analytically almost of no value whatsoever, because all it tells is that it tells you a bunch of people went to a country, settled there and wiped out the indigenous population. That in itself doesn't tell you anything about the economic structure that follows. The economic structure in some countries was capitalist, but in Algeria, it was not. It took 200 years for Algeria to become capitalist. So in and of itself, analytically, it goes absolutely. Is this Honda Wang, by the way? Yes, yeah. <laughs> you know I, Honda? Hi, Honda. Yeah, he, he, he's a student of mine. Um, oh, awesome. <laughs> many eons ago. Uh, so I think, I think Honda wants, I think he has a sense of what I was about to say and wanted me to say it. Um, <laughs> so... No, I, I think as a concept, uh, it's analytically null. It's a historical fact, but it's analytically null. I, I also don't abide by the fact, that they're by the claim that the American working class, what, what, how, how is it that you put it, Kenzo? The American working class what? Uh, let's see. U, U, U.S. Work, working class being a culpable for the extractive treatment. Uh, that's absolute nonsense. Culpable. It's one thing. You, you can try to make the argument that they benefit from it. You can try to make that there's, and I think that argument is wrong. It can be shown to be wrong, but it's not on its face absurd. But to say that they're culpable means that they're the ones calling the shots. What world are you living in if you think they're culpable? That makes no sense whatsoever. If that's true, then black Americans are culpable too. Yeah, you don't want to get into all of the various details. We are coming down to the last few seconds before our hour Vivek, we've already had an hour of time discussing <laughs> these issues. Now, the question I want to ask you, first of all, do you have any works, articles that you would like to promote while we have you here now? And also, would you be willing to come back and talk about further analyses on issues of this nature at some point in the future? Um, no, I, I wouldn't want to pimp out any of my work. If, if people are interested, they can just you know, they can go to my website. I, my, I have my CV on the website or they can Google me or something. But, um, you know, I, I've already kind of, I feel bad that I already said you should go read one of my articles. It's a little embarrassing. So I wouldn't want to say anything more beyond that. Uh, but coming back, sure, I'd be, I'd be happy to. I, this is an important show and I think what you're doing is important. Thank you very much. In fact, we appreciate that. So uh, Kenzo, do you have anything that you want to promote? Anything at all besides your shows? Uh, yeah, this uh, Sunday on twitch.tv slash class time at 6 p.m. Central, uh, we're hosting Meet the Left. Uh, Vivek, I'd love to have you on sometime uh, as well. I'd like to reach out sometime about that, uh, where we host a three-person uh, panel show all going over the weekly news uh, from the left. Uh, we have uh, Alderman Byron Sigcho this week, uh, Chicago Socialist Alderman, uh, as well as um, Aaron Thorpe, who's a writer and an organizer. And uh, it's going to be a great show. Kenzo, oh. good luck with your organizing. I'm very, very happy to meet you on this show. And great I'd to be meet more you than happy to uh, discuss, the, uh, uh, come on your show, but also just to talk sometime later. Um, oh, I'd love that. What's going on in Chicago is very important right now. Vivek, we'd love to have you on again, and we will reach out to you to do so. Thank you for coming on. You know, Subscribe to the show. Become a patron. Send us some super chats next time we're on. And for now, for those who are followers of This Is Revolution podcast, we are, are, we are not having an after hours today because Vivek has an obligation with his daughter. So we she's going away to college tomorrow, and uh, yes. I actually interrupted our last evening to do this. So I, I'm already in the shit house with her, and I, no I can't problem. ask her. <laughs> no problem, Vivek. We are out. Thank you. <laughs>